All right, so welcome to the first session of the MCAT prep for Bronx Hope Summer 2022. Uh, thanks for being here, excited to have you all. So our meeting times are going to be on Wednesday from five to seven and Tuesday from seven to nine every week for this month, okay? And so this is me, I'm Tazneen or Taz for short. My email is there. Uh, I graduated from Hunter and I have a degree in biochem. And you might be wondering, you know, who am I? Why am I here? Why am I teaching you guys? So I, oh, wait, before, oh, actually, no, before we do that, yeah, I would like to also meet you guys. So if you could unmute or post in chat, whatever, whatever you prefer, uh, your name, your undergraduate career, and, you know, one question that you have about the MCAT. So if, uh, does anyone want to go first? You can just raise your hand or just unmute. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Genesis. Um, I am a rising junior at Iona College, and my major is chemistry with a minor in entrepreneurship. And as of right now, I don't have a question about the MCAT. Um, I know that um, the MCAT is seven to eight hours, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the questions that I did have was if there were breaks, but um, then I realized there were. So I don't at this moment have any questions. OK, thank you for sharing, uh, Genesis. Who would, uh, aside from, instead of uh, one question about the MCAT, you can also tell me, like, you know, where you are with the MCAT. Like, maybe you've taken it before. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you haven't really started it. Whatever you want to, just your experience with it. Yeah, so I haven't taken the MCAT yet. I am planning to take a gap year because I want to take the MCAT after I finish college because I know that the MCAT is a really difficult exam and I want to have all my focus on the MCAT. So I'm planning to take it this summer after my senior year of college. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing. All right, who would like to go next? Um, so my name is Marianne. Um, I'm a undergrad at Iowa College, majoring in biochemistry. And a question about the MCAT. Um, what's like a reasonable amount of times can you take the MCAT? And what are the fees for the MCAT? I haven't taken the MCAT yet. I'm planning on either taking it this coming year or taking a gap year, depending on how I do next year so yeah okay thanks for sharing those are awesome questions we are going to answer all of your questions i am writing everything down don't worry who would like to go next hi i'm nayeli i'm a rising junior as well at fordham university university and i'm doing a majoring in bio and minoring in spanish and i actually don't know when i should be taking the mcat which is why i'm here just to have a better timeline with everything. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alphonse. Um, I am a, a, a rising a sophomore at Lehman College, and I don't have any questions of, uh, about MCAT now, but I'm, I'm also planning to take it gap year. So I will. Uh, uh, so I'm planning to take MCAT during that year. Thank you for sharing, Alphonse. Um, hi, my name is Yasmina, and I'm going to be attending the University of Buffalo in the fall, and I'm going to major in neuroscience. Uh, one question I have about the MCAT is what is like a reasonable about, amount of time you should set aside to study for the MCAT? And I don't really have a planned time on when I'm going to take it. I'm just mostly here to see what I could do to like learn more about it and cipher it before entering college. Awesome. Cool to see that you're being so proactive. Very cool. All right. Who is next? Um, hi, I'm Jasmine. Um, I'm going into my junior year at Lehman College. My major is biology with a concentration in brain sciences and a minor in disability studies. 
And one question I have, um, I'm not really familiar with the MCAT, but I'm planning on taking it. Um, so I just would like to know like what topics there will be, what should I study and yeah, thank you. Perfect and really interesting minors, very cool. Um, did everybody go? I'm, I think most people went. Uh, I don't think Samantha has gone. Samantha, would you like? To, oh, yeah, Samantha, go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, guys. I'm Samantha. Um, I'm a rising junior at Princeton University, and I'm planning to major in neuroscience with a potential um, minor in French. And I'm planning to take the MCAT in the spring of my junior year. So I'm really just here to kind of like get started on my journey like studying for the MCAT and just learning more about it and Samantha what where are you right now what year are you in oh I'm a rising junior so I'm gonna be a junior next year and you want to take your exam spring of your junior year yeah so so next spring yes next spring next spring got it all right thank you very much um has everyone gone Marianne, have you gone? I think I think almost everybody went. Um, if you're having microphone issues or anything like that, you can just post your answer in the chat. Okay. So thank you for sharing and glad to meet you all. So Obviously, one of the big themes is like how to study, what to study, just what is this test, right? That's a whole big thing. And so first of all, first off, like, who am I? And why should you listen to me? Or like, why should you bother at all, right? So I took this exam back in 2021. And I scored a 518, which is in the 95th percentile. So now, knowing this, I'm going to ask you a quick question. What do you think my GPA is based off that? You can put it in the chat. What do you think is my GPA based off a 95th percentile MCAT score? Mm, you guys, you guys are wise. Most people immediately go for A or B, right? I see a lot of B's and C's. In actuality, I've tricked you a little bit. Uh, it's actually an answer that wasn't there. So my GPA in undergrad was a 3.1. And the point of this exercise is to understand that you don't start at 518. You don't start here, right? Because the very first test that I took the very first, you know, practice test that I took for the first time was a 499, right? So what happened in between this, right? What is this error, right? This is obviously what you want to know and what I'm here to tell you, to explain to you, right? And it all starts with having a growth mindset. Many of you right now have a fixed mindset and you don't even know it, right? The idea that you can grow and that you can get better is something that's hard to see because you wouldn't see the result only when you, you only see the result when you look back. So for example, if you're at the base of a mountain, right? And you're looking up at the mountain and you're like, wow, this thing is so tall. How can I possibly climb to the top, right? And even while you're climbing to the top, you still feel like, oh my God, this mountain is so huge. This is impossible. This is terrible, right? But only when you actually get to the top and you look down, do you see how much ground you covered and how high you came, right? So having a growth mindset is really about telling yourself that you can improve and that not to be satisfied with what you can do or not to be stuck on what you can do right now, but work towards the future you and the future progress that you'll have. So Having a growth mindset and motivation and things like this are really important. And we're going to talk more about this in the future for sure. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of, you know, where I'm coming from and what my own personal journey was so that we can have a better understanding of how I want to help you guys. Um, so 
right now we're going to start getting into, you know, those basic questions of, you know, what is the MCAT? What are you actually being tested on, right? So we know that this test is designed, it's a standardized test that you have to take if you're applying for medical school in the United States, right? And so as a standardized test, they're going to talk a lot about the various, um, they're going to talk a lot about the various courses that you took in undergrad, right? Especially we talk about those prereqs, prereqs, right? So prereqs are prereqs because they show up on this exam, right? And there are four different sections. There's chemistry physics, there's critical analysis and reading skills, there's biology and biochemistry, and there's psychology and sociology, right? Chemistry and physics covers general chemistry, it covers physics one and two, and it covers organic chemistry one, not so much two because two is very much about like synthesis and specific reactions, mostly organic chemistry one and labs. Anytime that there's a lab, lab is huge on the MCAT. Lab and research and laboratory techniques, purification techniques, things like that. Lab is important. Lab is its own separate class sometimes, and it definitely is treated that way on the MCAT. So that's chemistry physics. Critical analysis and reading skills is a weird section on the MCAT because it's the only section where there is nothing to study for. What you're doing is you're getting these long passages that are passages about philosophy, passages about topics in the humanities like art history or opinionated arguments where the author is arguing passionately about something that he believes or he or she believes in. And this section you're reading and then you are trying to understand, you know, what the author believes, how the author thinks and how to answer the questions based off of that. After that, we have biology and biochemistry, which is obviously based on biology, biochemistry, as well as anatomy and physiology. So biochemistry is, is basically like a prereq. So if you are taking a, a major that doesn't really involve biochemistry, you will either have to teach it yourself or you're going to have to try to take biochemistry in some way because biochemistry is, is, is a big part of the biology biochemistry section. And the last course or the last section is the psychology and sociology section, which involves um, assorted topics from psychology and sociology. And it's kind of weird because like each, every college like breaks up their, their coursework differently in these. So it's hard to say like, oh, you need like intro level psych or you need this level sociology or whatever. You really just have to go by the MCAT's own content guidelines. And especially because the rigor, the level of rigor in psychology courses across, you know, the country might be different. It's not that every psychology course asks you to memorize like um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs or Erickson's stages of development or something like that. Not every, maybe not every lecture will ask you to do that, but the MCAT does ask you to memorize things like that. So for psychology and sociology, your best bet is really to go based off of their own MCAT curriculum. So any questions so far, as always, you can post questions in the chat at any time. Um, I do have a, I do see a question asking how many gap years did I take? That's a great question. So I graduated in 2019 and I'm applying this cycle. So in between that time, I was actually originally not pre-med. I was originally doing more like PhD route, but I ended up taking the MCAT uh, and I ended up, well, that's a story for another day, but in total, I would say I've taken like three gap years, but one of those gap years was like not, like one and a half of those, I was not actually pre-med. I wasn't actually working towards uh, any of this. That's why I only took the MCAT back in 2021 last year. Um, so if there are any other, if you have questions, you can just post in the chat. Otherwise, I'll just keep, uh, keep going. So we did have a question about breaks, right? And we did have a question about, you know, what does the actual exam look like? So the exam is quite long. The exam, this is probably the longest exam you'll, you've, you've, you've ever taken up to this point. And it is a, the actual test itself is only about, you know, six hours, but with the breaks included, you're looking at around eight hours. So what actually happens? Um, 
there's four different sections and each section is broken up with breaks, right? So the first section, you have chemistry and physics and the order is always the same. So you always get chemistry and physics first and that has 59 questions and you get about an hour and a half to answer those 59 questions, right? And each, each section has uh, some, some I, so it has some passage-based questions where you read a passage and then you answer questions based off the passage. And then some standalone questions which are not passage-based and they're just there on their own. So chemistry and physics first, then you get a 10 minute break and the breaks are optional. Um, and of course you have to go to, you have to go to a testing site to, to do this. And in the testing site, you know, there is security, there is somebody watching you while you're taking the test. You are putting all your, you know, belongings in a locker and you shouldn't have anything on you, stuff like that, right? Um, it is a serious exam. And so after your break, then you'll go back to the room and they will, you know, check that, you know, you haven't brought anything in and then you'll go back in the room and then you'll do critical analysis and reasoning. And this is 53 questions. And then you get a 30 minute break and then you get biology, biochemistry, then a 10 minute break, and then you finish it off with psychology and sociology. Um, here we have something called the void question. The void question basically refers to the fact that you can void your exam if you were not confident in how it went, essentially. So voiding means that you choose to not receive your score and it's like you didn't take the exam at all. So this is something, you know, you can't, you should go into the test with the intention of, you know, doing your best on it and, uh, and accepting whatever score you get. But if there's something going wrong, if you, I don't know, if you fell asleep during a section or if you just realized like you weren't ready, that, that, that is an option for you. And it's something to be aware of. Uh, okay. And again, if you have any questions, you can just post in the, in the chat. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how, how those prereqs actually um, shape the, the sections, right? So in the biology and biochemistry section, actually intro to bio is half of the exam. Intro to bio, like really knowing your cell bio, really understanding, you know, the central dogma, really understanding, uh, you know, bio two with DNA, RNA, all these stuff. These are, these are uh, a big part of this section. Then we talk about first semester biochemistry. So what is on the bio, what is on the biochemistry section is stuff like enzymes, stuff like metabolism. Um, stuff like proteins, right? Those are super important. You're not really going to go into stuff like uh, glycolysis, uh, not glycolysis, sorry, um, photosynthesis, right? You're not going to really be talking about plant biochemistry. We're mostly focused on, on physical anatomy. Then there's also anatomy and physiology because we do talk about organ systems on the, on the exam. We do talk about, you know, the functions of hormones, the functions of various organs like the liver and the kidneys, right? So this is like, I put it as 15% because it is a good chunk of material that you need to know. And then we have bio, you know, in the bio biochemistry section, I'm including 5% uh, gen chem and 5% organic chemistry because it does come up. They can tie it into, right? They can ask you like, what is the structure of a lipid based hormone, right? Or a cholesterol based hormone, right? So that is essentially organic chemistry but in the context of biology and biochemistry. So those kinds of relationships, those kinds of synthesis happens quite often. And so we do have a question in the chat, wouldn't medical school see the score because it's in the system or they wouldn't see it since you said no to the void question. So you would actually say yes to the void question. If you, the question is, do you want to void the score? And voiding the score means that it doesn't exist. And then medical schools do not see the score. It doesn't exist at all. Medical schools would see your score if you accept your if you accept the the score, and then you have that score. And you cannot if you retake the exam, right? It does not replace your score. It merely shows up as a second score. It shows up as a future score with the date. So that's one thing to consider with voiding, right? If you void, it's stricken from the record. However, you can only void while you are there obviously, right? Like you can't, you can only void at the end of that exam. You can't leave the building and then suddenly think, 
oh, I think I did badly. I need to go avoid it. You can't. You can only do it while you're there. So not a huge thing, but still something just good to be aware of. So um, yes, so we're talking about biology and biochemistry. And what are we actually talking about? Basically, we went over. And here is a, a resource that I'll post in the chat after the presentation, which is the content outline. The content outline is basically, you know, the, the grail, the table of contents for the MCAT, right? Where you can see everything that will be tested. And it is a laundry list, right? When you're looking at it, you'll be like, how, how can I do this? How, there's so much material. We're going to talk about how to get through this material. But just for you to, you know, scope it out right now to understand what's on it. We talk about molecular biology, evolution, and metabolism. So this includes stuff that you probably haven't learned yet, like amino acids, right? The specific amino acids, the identities of amino acids, huge, huge, huge topic, right? That you kind of learn in biochemistry. Uh, transmission of genetic information from gene to protein. This is stuff that you learned in, in bio two, probably with, you know, tra um, translation, uh, transcription and translation, right? Um, Heritable information, genetics, Mendelian genetics, evolution, those kinds of things. Principles of bioenergetic, bioenergetics and fuel molecule metabolism. This is strictly biochemistry. This is glycolysis. This is Krebs cycle. This is electron transport chain and more, more things that you probably, that you may not have even learned. Um, then we have the whole idea of cell biology, you know, comparing prokaryotes to eukaryotes, understanding organelles, understanding the roles of organelles, understanding how cells grow, right? And then finally, we have anatomy and physiology, which is more, not so much about like, if you've taken an anatomy class, you've probably seen like lots and lots of memorization about like, you know, these specific muscles, these specific bones, blah, blah, blah. It's not so much about memorization, it's more about understanding what the function of those organs is, how they play a role in our body, right? So that's what's on the MCAT for the biology and biochemistry section. And of course, you can ask questions in the chat at any time. Now, the other very, the other science heavy section, right? Chemistry and physics. So in chemistry and physics, chemistry and physics is, is a bit of an odd section because you're only getting 59 questions, right? And the distribution of questions that you get in each section is not uniform. So what I mean is that one test taker might get a test that has a chemistry and physics section that focuses a lot on general chemistry, right? Another test taker might get one that focuses more on physics. So it is a little, there is a little bit of variance in what materials show up um, because there's only 59 questions. They're not gonna ask you evenly about everything. So, on this uh, section, it's about, it's a little leaning more towards general chemistry, right? But still a very heavy focus on physics. And biochemistry also shows up here, but again, more of a focus on the actual chemistry of the molecules, right? Organic chemistry, I know, I'm sure like many of you have struggled or will struggle with organic chemistry. For the MCAT, it's actually not that bad. It doesn't show up that much. Um, especially in comparison to the other uh, uh, subjects, right? It is something that you need to be aware of, but more along the lines of in the context of general chemistry, not so much, and in biochemistry. So not so much like you probably won't be busting out like organic chemistry synthesis on the MCAT. And then there's again, a little bit of intro bio because all of these sections are kind of cross contaminating and kind of, you know, melding all these topics together. And so for the MCAT, the chemistry, oh, a question. This is a random question, but how many times can you take the MCAT? Does it have any limits? Yes, it does actually. I believe that the lifetime limit is seven takes. And in the year, in a year, it might be four. I'm not sure if those numbers have been updated, but I know that there is a lifetime limit that you can take the MCAT. As far as I know, most people take it like once or twice. And then I would imagine that the second, the second biggest group would be people taking it three to four times. I think that hitting the actual max is a very is is a is not 
something that people really do because it's not a, a sound strategy. Um, you, if, because remember, every time you take the test, your score is recorded, right? And so medical schools, you know, it's okay to take the test once and not do so hot and then take it again and improve, right? That's good. That shows resilience. That shows medical schools like, oh, this person had a setback. They changed something and, and they did better this time. That's perfectly fine. What you don't want to have is, you know, fluctuations, right? If you take it three times and you do bad and then you do good and then you do bad, that's not, that's not something that they want to see because that, that's not giving them confidence in your ability to, to handle standardized testing. And of course, remember, as physicians, right, as medical students, we'll be taking more um, standardized exams later on to become licensed, right? So this is just the first of many, just the first of many. Um, but learning some le lessons here about how to approach these kinds of exams and how to really prepare for them is going to take away a lot of the stress and a lot of the guesswork. Okay, so thank you for your question. Um, so now, chemistry and physics content, right? F physics was my worst subject in undergrad. I did not understand it. I, some might argue I still don't understand it. Um, the Physics on this exam, it usually is in the context of biology. So it's kind of interesting. When we talk about, you know, stuff like fluid dynamics, in the MCAT, it's usually in the context of the movement of blood and the circulation of blood, right? So it is kind of cool that you can, maybe you're not so interested in physics, but if you're interested in biology, seeing that crossover might be enough for you to get interested in and want to study physics. So we do see a, wi a wide array of physics um, topics, such as you know Newtonian motion, mechanics. We do uh, talk about fluid flow and fluid properties. We do talk about electrochemistry and circuits, which is might seem like out of the blue, why do we need to know circuits? We're not engineers, we're doctors. Why? Because it can be applied to um, fluids. It can be applied to blood flows through veins and capillaries and stuff like that. So there is crossover, right? Anytime that you're studying something for this test and you're like, I don't get it. What is the relationship? There usually always is a relationship. There is a point to what they're asking you about. Um, how light and sound interact with matter. How does that relate? Chemotherapy, radiation, right? Like these are things that do actually have uh, and atoms and nuclear decay, right? These are all things that have relevance. So the, it, they are actually worthwhile to know. Um, and then uh, otherwise we have regular chemistry or general chemistry, right? Which is more, you know, uh, atoms and chemistry lab with like separation and purification and understanding thermodynamics and kinetics, all these things that you are probably were exposed to for the first time in general chemistry. So that, that's the breakdown of everything on the chemistry physics uh, section. Now we have the psychology and sociology section. And this is actually the newest section. I believe it was introduced in 2015. And this section is testing psychology and sociology, right? And just a little bit of, of brain anatomy and biology, just a little bit. And so what do we mean by psychology and sociology? Well, we're talking about human behavior human emotions, and also social concepts like uh, cultural, like uh, aspects of culture, aspects of society, things like gentrification, things like power. These are things that are, are part of this whole curriculum. And so overall, the, you can kind of break it down into these separate uh, foundations, right? So sensation and cognition is how we process things in our own body, right? And how we, our cognition, how we understand things. So this is a, a, a science, how we, you know, the nervous system, you know, how do, how do we understand visual cues, right? This is all in there. Behavior, right? Understanding attitudes and social behavior and influences on behavior. This is another aspect, right? And lastly, we have sociology, which seems like its own little part, but it is actually quite expansive because for all of these, there is a lot of 
um, kind of vocabulary to understand and a lot of not just vocabulary, but also concepts, more along the lines of concepts to understand, right? And this is especially uh, difficult if you kind of are, uh, how to explain it? Like, it's unlikely that in your undergrad career, you might take all of these courses, but you might not retain all of these courses just because everybody has their own uh, interest in different courses, right? So maybe you took sociology and, and psych because you had to as a prereq, but maybe it didn't really interest you, right? So when, and that's going to be a different course for everybody, right? I guarantee not like, uh, and some of you are not, uh, haven't taken most of these courses yet too, right? Um, so in that sense, you'll find that when you're studying for this exam, you'll have to focus on different things, right? Compared to your neighbor, right? Somebody might be really focused. There are people who are, you know, not originally uh, STEM majors, right? People who went to school for something else and then later decided they wanted to do medicine. And then they had to go back for those prereqs and kind of learn it alongside uh, their class, but also heavily on their own. So everybody has a different approach and a different journey to, to these different sections. Okay, finally, we have the critical analysis and reading section, and I left this for last because, like I mentioned before, this exam, I mean, this section of the exam does not have anything to study for. The only thing that you need to do for this section is practice and practice reading and practice answering questions. And what we actually get in terms of the content of this section is three different styles of questions. We have foundations of comprehension which is essentially understanding what the passage is talking about. We have reasoning within the text, which is essentially manipulating the information and the logic within the text, like right? making assumptions about what the author believes within the text. And then the, or rather than assumptions, making interpretations of what the author believes. And then lastly, we have reasoning beyond the text. So this kind of question is very easy to spot because in the question, they will ask you, what if some new information? They will introduce some new information and your job is to kind of relate it to the passage and understand, would this fit with the passage? Would it not fit with the passage? Does it make sense or does it not make sense? So you can see that there's not actually you know, you don't need to, it's not like the SAT, you don't need to memorize vocabulary words. You don't need to go reading like a lot of philosophy or whatever on your downtime. You could do that if you want to just get used to reading, right? But the key here, the answering questions and solving, getting better at answering the questions doesn't happen through studying, it happens through practice. Happen, there's not anything that you really need to memorize for this section. So that's an overview of Oh, sorry. And last but very much not least, right? Scientific reasoning. So scientific reasoning is kind of listed as, it's, it's like its own thing, right? And if you have the opportunity to do some kind of research in like a lab, uh, in a lab setting, before you take the MCAT, I highly recommend that you do that. And the reason is, the MCAT thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly tests your knowledge of lab techniques, right? Not just gen chem, not just organic chem, not just biochem, and not even limited to your undergraduate lab techniques, right? You can be asked about specific lab techniques that you may have never been exposed to, right? Because they are included on the content um, of the, the MCAT, right? So, the point of, of, of having you understand these lab techniques is to understand their purpose and how they, how they function, right? So for example, if we're looking at a purification technique, right? The point is to understand how does it purify things based on what property of the molecule, right? Maybe it's something about polarity. Maybe it's something about the mass of a molecule. Maybe it's something about the charge of a molecule, right? And the reason that you need to know that is because they can ask you like, oh, here are two molecules. What if we did, you know, chromatography, like size exclusion chromatography, 
right? So which molecule would come out first, right? That is a very typical kind of critical thinking question where you have to understand, oh, they're talking about this one. And I know that this one, it, it functions based off of the uh, property of mass, right? And so that's kind of where they're getting you to, to they want your headspace to be in. They want you to be able to manipulate scientific variables. They want you to understand uh, scientific concepts and experimental design, right? A lot of, lot of, lot of the questions on the MCAT passages are based on experiments, based on even real experiments, like real experiments that you would see in a scientific journal that was published in a scientific journal. They take real experiments, they edit it down, and then they put it into the test. And you can, you'll see when you take the test, if you scroll down, you'll see the citation of a real life, real world journal article. And so they want you to be able to read a scientific journal article and be able to understand what were the scientists testing for? What was the independent variables in this, in this experiment? What was the dependent variables? Did the scientists prove their hypothesis, right? Those understanding how to think like a scientist, understanding how lab techniques work, my best advice to you to get into the habit of, of to understand that is to very much um, do your best in your lab classes and try to understand why you're doing stuff, right? It's very easy to, when you're doing lab classes, very easy to just look at the lab report or, or look at the procedure as just like a recipe and just do it, right? But if you really take the time to understand what each step is doing and why you're doing it, that's going to save you a lot of time in the long run because you're going to be able to have these memories of like in the future, you're gonna be like, oh, I remember when I did this in this class. Oh, I remember that, right? So your lab experience, the reason I'm emphasizing so much on lab experience is because it's not a guarantee that you will get lab research experience. It's just not a guarantee, right? You have to you know, make the time and not everybody has the time to just do like unpaid undergraduate lab experience, right? It, that's just a reality. So you have to make the time uh, if you can, if your circumstances allow you to try to get some sort of lab research in or some sort of um, lab exposure, just so that you'll have a better understanding of the scientific method, of the scientific reasoning and how we, we do lab work. Okay, so that was a little bit of a long spiel. Um, any questions about, about labs in particular or anything that we've talk, talk, talked about so far? Yes, absolutely. Science lab classes do count. Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that if you're, I want you to really try to pay attention in your science lab class and try to understand all the procedures because you will have to know the procedures in the long run. So I know that when I did my lab reports, after I finished my lab report, that was it. I stopped thinking about it, right? But you know, if you're trying to be proactive, if you're trying to really know about things, um, for the future, you want to have, you want to, you know, maybe even like keep like a little record of like, oh, you know, I, I, these are all of the lab techniques that I've been exposed to, and this is how they work, right? And so, so that your lab experience is actually fruitful, and that you actually are collecting various different lab techniques as you go through all these different labs in your undergraduate uh, career. And that's also going to help you if you decide to pursue any kind of, um, you know, laboratory clinical research job in the future, right? If you're, a lot of you mentioned gap years, right? That's a big uh, option, right? To get some research experience, maybe even some clinical uh, experience if you decide to do like clinical research uh, or research coordination, anything like that, right? So yes, lab classes do count, but you have to make them count. What type of text do they use in the reading slash critical thinking section? Great question. So the type of text that they use is, I think I had it here, philosophy, humanities, and opinionated arguments. So there are some of these passages that when you read them, you will be, you will be like, your eyes will glaze over and you'll have no idea what, what they're talking about. Um, 
they can feel very dense. They can feel very weird. Um, but ultimately, they are readable. And your job is not, it's not, so I'll give you an example, right? The point of these passages is for you to be able to read and extract, you know, what is the main idea? What does this author care about? And how do they feel about it? The reason this section is hard, and actually this section, I'll show you later, I have a slide uh, about the average scores on each section. Um, but the reason that this is hard is because, for example, let's say you have a textbook, right? And you read a textbook for, for class. Have you ever stopped and wondered, like, who wrote this textbook? Or like, who is, who is the person that wrote this textbook? Or like, should I trust this textbook? Is this tech? Is this not? Is this like information actually like correct? I'm guessing for most of us, we never actually did that, and we just accepted that like, oh, you know, the instructor assigned this textbook, and this textbook is good, right? On this exam, you are kind of questioning every text that you read. You're trying to understand, okay, who is this author? Is this author biased? Is he trying to convince me of something? Uh, you know, it's like, and so the t so the style of uh, text that we get are things like um, long articles. So by long, I mean like maybe usually these guys are like five to seven ish paragraphs. Well, they're not full paragraphs. Well, they can be full paragraphs. It's variable, but I would I would wager around six paragraphs per passage, right? And then a passage, after you do a passage, you get like six or seven questions. And the topics I'll give you, the topics can be about anything. They can be about anything. I remember I had a topic about like um, Native American quilts, right? Like, and the, the meaning about of Native American quilts to, to their culture and like, you know, how they, how they use them and how they're passed on and whatnot, right? It can be an informative kind of, passage where they're just talking about something or it can be an opinionated argument so it can be something like i believe that you know this 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 has is a very negative thing right but it wouldn't be that straightforward they would just talk about it and then they would interject their opinion so it is not straightforward to read but it is more palatable once you know what you're looking for and i can show you some examples um, after we get through the presentation. Okay, so does that kind of answer your question? Or do you need some more clarification? And one important thing, actually one important point, on the critical analysis and reading skill section, you probably would not get scientific articles. You don't really get scientific articles. And so that's something very interesting. You have to really read in a way that, you know, pre-med STEM people are not really used to reading. Um, so you wouldn't, there's no, there's not really scientific articles given here. There's no graphs, there's no tables, there's nothing like that. It's just a straight chunk of, it's like reading a high level newspaper. It's like reading like um, the Financial Times or something, but a little bit more in depth, like in-depth reporting. Um, so yeah, if you, the only thing I would recommend is if you don't, well, okay, we'll, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. All right, any other questions? Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about what the MCAT questions are actually testing you. What are, what are they actually testing you about? How do they test you, All right? So let's say that we have this fact here. Let's say we have the fact the sky is blue, right? Now, if I asked you to make a question that tests this knowledge, right? What kind of question could you ask, right? What's a question that you could ask? Let's say you, 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 you know this thing and you want to ask somebody if they know that the sky is blue. So what question would you ask? 
what's a simple question that comes to mind? What could you ask about the sky? Exactly, right? What color is the sky? What color is the sky? Actually, it's word for word, right? It's a very simple, it's a very straightforward to the point question because it tests you on the fact and then you, you, you either know the fact or you don't, right? So that's perfect, right? What color is the sky? And this is a kind of question that anybody could come up with because they fundamentally understand the point of the question. The point of the question is to test the knowledge, you know, what it, the sky is blue, to test this fact, to test the knowledge of this fact. This is not, this is not how the MCAT asks you questions, right? This is how the MCAT asks you a question. So take a moment to read this. Take a moment to really digest this. Okay, I want you guys to tell me like, what do you see is different about this compared to the previous one? What's, what's different, what's similar? What stands out to you about this question? And you can unmute or you can type in the chat, whatever you like. I think what's different about this question is that um, one, it's like very indirect and kind of the knowledge that the sky is blue is kind of just like, you're assumed to have that knowledge in a way that I think is different from the other question, like what color is the sky? Like, I feel like this question, the foundation of the question is that the sky is blue and you have to know that to be able to accurately answer the question. But in a way that's different than just like saying what color is the sky. Absolutely, that was a wonderful breakdown. Because you, you, you've hit on the key point, right? The key point that you are being tested on the knowledge. You are being tested on the fact that the sky is blue, but in a very indirect manner. You're not being directly asked. You're being indirectly asked. The question, the test maker is already assuming, forcing you, he's, he's forcing the assumption that you must know the color of the sky. And now answer a question on top of that, on top of that. Right. So based on, you know, the understanding that the sky is blue, which of these choices do you think answers the question? You can just post in the chat. OK, why, why do you say what? So we have B or C, right? And we have another C. We have another C. We have a C, we have a C. Okay, so let's talk about this, right? Let's try to understand, right? Genesis, I would love to know your, your, you know, your thought process between B and C. Hello? Hello? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Sorry, I had my AirPods in. Um, so the way I basically tried to answer this question was I looked at it and I was like, you know what, A is out of the question because you can see, you know, an airliner flying, you can see a bald eagle. So it left me with B and C. I was going to choose C, but then I was like, you know what, what happens if it's also B because it's displaying an ad. And I was thinking, you know what, in the sky, it would be difficult to see the wording of the ad. Um, so that's why I was like kind of thinking it could be that even though it does say a large blimp. So that was my reasoning why I was also thinking B could also be an option. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So there's a really, there. how Genesis was thinking through this question was really great. And, and okay, so, so I want to basically, I'm just going to kind of, take some time to, to really break down this question. So first off, she said that A 
right, was just obviously wrong because it's easy to see, right? And so she crossed it out. And then she also said that D was also easy to see and she crossed it out, right? Notice how this question was, let's say we didn't know anything about this question, right? Before it was a 25% chance to get the correct answer. Now it's a 50% chance. Almost all of the MCAT questions are like this, where there are two distractor choices that are much easier to understand that they are wrong compared to the other two, right? And then you're left with a little bit of an annoying choice between two. And sometimes this is very difficult. Sometimes it's, very, it's not so difficult, right? It just depends on the question. But you're left with a choice. And that choice involves careful, careful deliberation. So what happened uh, is that, you know, advertisement, she was thinking about advertisement, right? But sometimes a choice gets, you know, you're caught up in the choice, whereas one word is changing the whole thing. Imagine if the word blimp wasn't here, right? Or imagine if instead of large, it said blue, right? That would change the answer choice completely, right? So sometimes just one choice, I mean, sometimes just one word will kind of clue you in that a choice is not the best one, right? And so most everybody went with this one because we had blue jay, right? And so blue jay, so overall, you know, the logic of this, uh, of this answer is, uh, I think right here, yes. So like we talked about before, I, th I believe like Samantha said, we have some prior knowledge, right? The prior knowledge, the content knowledge is that the sky is blue. And now we have to use our critical thinking to determine that a blue jay is a blue bird. And since it's blue on blue, that bird would be difficult to distinguish. So do you kind of see how the MCAT MCAT questions are incredibly different probably to any test that you've ever taken because you don't really see questions like this. You mostly see questions like this, right? Even up to, I'm sure like up to high school and maybe even in undergrad, depending on the class, your questions tend to look like this. They don't tend to look like this. So any questions about, you know, the style of question or the approach to the question, um, or any thoughts about, about this, you know, scenario? Okay, so then I'll ask, what do you think the MCAT actually tests, right? After going through this, through this, um, through this exercise, right? What is the MCAT actually testing us on? Prior knowledge, right? Prior knowledge, good. Is it only testing us on prior knowledge? We can, we can kind of combine vocabulary into, into content knowledge, right? But content knowledge is just the first step. Think about this question, right? So, so this question is strictly asking us about content knowledge, right? How is this question different to this question? What did this question add? Okay, nice. The ability to use prior knowledge to then make assumptions, right? So to then make assumptions, the way that that you know they describe this as, right, is critical thinking. So ultimately, this test tests your ability to think critically based upon content knowledge. And sometimes it's not even based on content knowledge because in the car section, there is no content knowledge, right? You're just purely doing critical thinking.
So this is ultimately the fundamental misconception about what this exam is. The fundamental misconception, you know, a lot of people take this test just by studying material and then going straight into the test, maybe doing one or two practice exams, right? That is not the way to take this test because yes, you can improve your content knowledge by studying. Yes, you absolutely can. But you can't improve your critical thinking just by studying. What is the only way to improve your critical thinking, right? The only way to improve your critical thinking is to actually do problems like we just did and thinking about these relationships, right? So the proof is right here. And this is, um, you know, directly from the, oh, if you don't know, the AAMC is the American Association of Medical Colleges, and they're the ones that uh, distribute this exam. So, uh, so what I have here is, is a graph of the, the average uh, section scores per, for, for on the MCAT. And so what you'll notice is that in chemistry and physics, the average is 125, the in biology and biochemistry, it's again average of 125. Psychology and sociology, average of 125, close to 126. But then look here, critical analysis and reading, average of 124. Right? This is the lowest one. And the reason it's the lowest one is because you cannot use content knowledge as, as a crutch to improve your scores. You can only learn to think critically more. You can only get better at your critical thinking and get better at your practice. So that's why this is consistently the lowest one. And I would, I would assume that your performance in the critical analysis um, section is probably a very strong predictor of your performance in the other sections. Why? Because if you can critically think about no content, then you can critically think about content. And it's much easier to just learn material than to learn how to critically think. So it's great that you guys are a little bit more early on in your journey, right? At least you're all still in undergrad and you're all still like looking at taking the MCAT, you know, maybe a year-ish away. So you have time to, to start thinking about critical or to start thinking critically, to, uh, to start focusing on critical thinking, because that's not something that comes quickly. And it's not something that comes without a lot of hard work and a lot of you know, introspection into your own ways of thinking and modes of thinking. Okay. So any questions about critical thinking? Does everybody understand what I mean by critical thinking? Okay, cool. So, okay, so now we sh I showed you like a template question, right? I showed you like a, a, a made up question. Now I'll, I'll ask you, this is a real MCAT question. This is a real question from uh, MCAT practice materials, right? And so here we're going to see this, that process that we just went through for real. So this question asks, Researchers conducted an experiment to test social loafing. They asked participants to prepare an annual report or a tax return. Some participants performed the task individually and others performed it as a group. What are the independent and dependent variables? So before we go into you know, the answer choices, right? What are the important terms in this question that you see? What stands out to you as, oh, this, this is important for me to be able to understand this question?
So we have here individually versus group. OK. What else? Anything else important in this question? An annual report or a tax return. Very good. What else is important in this question? Social loafing. Now, what is that? Social loafing seems important. So, very good. Now, does everyone know what an independent and a dependent variable are? Can somebody explain what is an independent variable and a dependent variable? So this is kind of, you know, we're talking about this is why we're talking about the importance of lab and the importance of research, right? Because this is a question that is a scientific experimental question, right? You're being asked to understand what is an independent and a dependent variable. And that's, you know, the hallmarks of, of a scientific experiment. So an independent variable, right? Or an IV, right? Doesn't depend on anything doesn't depend on anything, okay? And then the dependent variable would be depending on something, right? What would the dependent variable be depending on? Exactly, depending on the independent variable, right? So now to clarify, the the i well actually wait so one second so first things first right let's look at the the answer choices now all right so they're telling us that answer choice a is saying the first let's just look at the independent variable choices because we'll look at it says the independent variable is the type of task and the dependent variable is this or the independent variable is a type of task and the dependent variable is this, or the independent, so let's just look, let's just go one at a time and compare the answer choices just talking about the independent variable. So here we see the independent variable, so let me just highlight it for you. So first off, we see the independent variable is the type of task, or, so it's either the type of task, or it's the, whether the participant worked alone or in a group and whether the participant worked alone or in a group. So what is an independent variable, right? In an experiment, what is an independent variable? It doesn't depend on anything, right? Whether the participant worked alone or in a group, did that depend on everything? Did that depend on anything? Versus the type of task, did that depend on anything? What do you guys think? You can put, you can either put, um, put blue if you think it's the first one and put red in the chat if you think it's the second one for the independent variable. Take some time to think about it and then, and then you know. Okay, can someone explain to me why they think it's blue? Um, I think it's blue because the experiment, the researchers themselves, like, 
that was the condition that they changed, whether or not they were submitting an annual report or a tax return. And the independent variable is usually controlled by like whoever's conducting the experiment. Very good. And why do you think it's not whether they worked alone or in a group? Should I still answer? Oh, anybody can, yeah. Well, I think Samantha basically said it, right? Because we were talking about how the independent variable is the one that the researchers are manipulating, right? So here, the researchers, so we can phrase this more simply as the IV or the independent variable is the researchers decide, right? The researchers decide the independent variable. They decide whether it's going to be a report or a tax return. Now, in this one, whether the participant worked alone or in a group, that some participants performed it individually and others performed as a group. So that is not saying that the researchers had anything to do with that decision, right? So therefore that wouldn't be the independent variable. So again, notice the pattern of the 50-50. Notice that by doing this, we eliminated two options, right? So you want to work through this in this systematic way. Right? You don't want to uh, analyze each choice one by one. Okay, I read choice A, then I read choice B, then I read choice C, then I read choice D. No. You want to look at, recognize the fact that A and B both share one part and C and D both share one part. So then analyze just that piece of information. And if that piece of information can be you know, wrong if for one of them, then you know that you've immediately eliminated two choices without having to worry about the rest of the answers. So, and obviously the thing is like, you should do this if you can know that something is wrong, right? If you know it, if you don't know it, then you could be, you know, writing off an answer choice that is correct because you just didn't really understand what an independent variable is. But if you understand what an independent variable is, and you know for a fact that it's going to be A or B, then you don't have to waste time looking at C and D, right? So now we're looking at the rest of A and B, right? And they're saying the dependent variable, so that the, the variable depending on the IV is either the participant's contribution to the task or, or, whether the participants worked alone or in a group. So now I want you to take a moment and then you can post in the chat whether you think it is red or, or meaning choice A or whether you think it's B, choice B. So you can either go with A or B. Okay, we have two answers so far. I would like everybody to answer this question. Okay, last call for answers. Seems like everybody's almost got it. All right. So does anybody want to explain why they think it's B?
Um, is it okay if I answer? Absolutely. Um, so I think the reason why it's B is because the whole point of the experiment was to test for social loafing. So they wanted to figure out whether participants are able to work better as in a group or as individually rather than a participant contributing to the task because the whole point is to see how well they work with others or by themselves. Awesome. So very, very good so far, right? We've worked through our, our we've worked through the independent variable part. And now we've talked about, you know, what is the point of this experiment to test social loafing? And then we've hit upon, um, you know, whether participant worked alone or in a group. Now, here's the fun part. B is not the correct answer. And here's why B is not the correct answer. What is social loafing? What is social loafing? When I asked you, you know, what is the most important part of this question, right? You said individually and as a group, you said the annual report or the tax return. But the very first one should have been social loafing. Why? Because I'm pretty sure most of you have never heard of this term before. And if you've never heard of a term before, it's important. It's important. This is a term from psychology. So this is how, we remember, we were talking about that content knowledge and critical thinking, right? This, I purposely have asked you this question because I'm showing you how we can think critically, but then lack the content knowledge. If you lack the content knowledge, you can also get the answer wrong because just because of the way that they've written the question. So what is social loafing? Social loafing is the tendency for people to exert less effort if they are being evaluated as a group instead of being held individually accountable. Do you want a real life example of social loafing right now? We are all here. You guys are all here as a group, right? So when I ask for people to answer questions, some of you are probably thinking, I don't need to answer because somebody else will answer. This is social loafing, right? I'm not criticizing anybody. You don't have to answer. I'm just giving you a relevant, you know, topical example. You are social loafing when you are in a group and you decide, oh, somebody else will do it, so I don't have to do it. Now imagine if you weren't in a group and you were the only one here. When I asked questions, you would have no choice but to answer, right? Because you're the only one there. If you don't do it, who else is gonna do it? Nobody. So this is what social loafing is. So now, if we go back and look at the question, right? Which one sounds more like the actual definition of social loafing? Is it the contribution to the task? Or is it whether people worked alone or in a group? It's contribution to the task, right? Because social loafing is already talking about group, already presuming a group, right? And notice the connection here. Notice the parallel. In the, in the previous, in the, in the template question that I asked, right, about the sky, right, this question presumes the knowledge that the sky is blue. So therefore, this question presumes that you understand the definition of social loafing and that you understand they are trying to test the social loafing of people. And if, social, if it's testing social loafing, it's testing people who are in groups. So that, I hope this is like an eye-opening you know, example of how you can, how there are two different um, vectors or two different modes that you're being tested. Now you're being tested on one aspect, which is content knowledge, which is knowing definitions, understanding things. And actually there was a very uh, good thing that you did by accident, which was saying that we're testing social loafing and therefore it's about whether it's task individually or task as a group. But that wasn't what social loafing actually was. You just assumed that that's what it was, right? And this is something that, that, that can happen, right? That's why your content, when you do your content review, 
you're really going to test yourself deeply on do I actually know these things, right? It's easy for us to trick just because of psychology. Where it's easy for us to trick ourselves and say like, oh yeah, I know that. Oh, that makes sense, right? It's easy to assume things. This test is written in a way to trap you if you assume. This test is really, really, because the only reason that they've put this, the only reason that this sentence is here, that some participants perform this task individually and others performed as a group, is just to trap you with B. That's it. Otherwise, you can remove this from the whole thing. You can utterly remove this sentence and the question works fine. So that is purely there to distract you. And you would fall for it if you didn't know what social loafing was, because that's how the question is designed. They want to trap you. They want to trap you because they don't want you to get it right unless you actually know the knowledge and you're actually thinking critically, right? They don't want you to be able to guess and get it right. So, so the key, so, so overall, right? The point is that the answer is A, because not only do you need to have some, some content knowledge here, right? But then you also need to have the ability to do critical thinking to distinguish it from the other choices, to distinguish it, especially from, from C and D, right? To know like, oh, this is how an independent variable works. This is how we, this is how we manipulate an experiment, okay? So overall, to explain this all, right? Just the same, look again, let's go to the parallel to, uh, to, the, to the sky is blue. So we said using prior knowledge that the sky is blue, we can use critical thinking to determine that a blue jay is a blue bird that would be difficult to distinguish in a blue sky, right? So now our explanation for this, for this following one is knowing the definition of social loafing allows us to determine that an experiment to test social loafing must be measuring the task contribution of a group member, right? Because that is inherently what social loafing is actually testing. When people are in a group, how much effort do they do, right? And you can see this, um, oh, this is actually another, I'm giving you uh, another, uh, term, which is social facilitation, right? Which is that, you know, when their social facilitation happens, when you're being graded, when people are, you know, expecting things of you, then you're like, oh, like, for example, when you're at work, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe if your boss is at work and watching you closely, you're sitting up a little straighter and you're working a little bit harder, right? But maybe when your boss isn't around, you're kind of slouching down and you're kind of taking it easy, right? That's facilitation versus, um, well, actually, it's not loafing is specifically in the context of the group, right? So that's not an exact comparison. It's more like if there were if there were multiple people, but that's the idea between facilitation and, and, and loafing. Um, so yeah, so any questions about this, about this example? Did this kind of like, was, was it a little bit of a shock that it was not me? Because because for me, it was definitely a very like surprising thing to get used to this kind of um, to this kind of style of asking questions or the style of thinking. So I'm sure like for you guys, this is probably like the first time that you've seen something like this. What are your you know reactions or your thoughts or anything? Yes, you absolutely have to read carefully. And not only the thing is that like something that seems obvious is never obvious. Like thing, it's like a it's it's I I like to call it a bait. It's like a bait and you're a hook, you're a fish. And are you gonna get hooked on the line or are you gonna avoid it? Right? You truly have to think about you truly have to read carefully and consider every word. Every word truly is meaningful, right? And so what, what you're going to get good at over time is picking out the, word, the keywords, right? You're going to get good at seeing like, oh, social loafing, I've already reviewed that. I know, I know that this is important. I know what they're talking about with social loafing. I know they're talking about group dynamics. So, so that is kind of, so 
when we say reading carefully, yes, reading carefully and picking out the relevant terms, right? And thinking deeper, thinking not just taking the, the answer choice that looks beautiful, right? Now, ultimately, right, from my experience, the answer choice that looks beautiful tends to be wrong. And the answer choice that looks kind of weird, but has nothing wrong with it, is the correct choice. That, that, that's ultimately what it ends up being like. Because there's always going to be a choice that you're like, oh, this has to be the right answer. But if you would only go a little further, if you would only dig a little deeper, you would see like, oh, wait a minute, this word is kind of weird. Oh, wait, that word is kind of, wait, that's actually conflicting with the question. Oh, is this really, wait, maybe this is wrong, right? You're going to go through that process. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to mull over a question. You're going to, you're going to mull over an answer choice and you'll go from like, oh, this has to be the answer to, wait a second, let me revisit that other answer choice. And then when you're comparing the two, you'll realize, oh, wait a minute, this other answer choice, it doesn't look as good, but there's just nothing wrong with it. So I, I guess this is the right answer. And it usually is. So this is, this is, I hope that this was very um, eye-opening because it, it, it should be that they are trying to trap you. They are not your friends. They are, in many ways, they are your enemies and they are trying to trap you. And it's your job and your goal to get to the point where you won't be trapped and you won't be tricked, right? The other factor that we are going to talk about more in the future is, is timing, right? And so this process, obviously, we're spending a lot of time on it now because it's your very first exposure. But once you're, you know, when you're really ready, this is not a huge process. This is second nature. This is a matter of maybe like a minute at most, right? It's you quickly, like within 10, 20 seconds, like figuring out like, okay, these two choices are wrong because it's a contradiction of the content, right? The choices that are wrong are going to outright contradict your content knowledge. And that's why they're easy to eliminate. Right? The independent variable is whether the participant worked or alone in a group. Is that what they, the researchers decided? No, that's not what they decided. Boom, that's wrong. Boom, that's the logic. That's as far as the logic goes that you need to eliminate C and D. Then within A and B, you need to think a little bit deeper. You need to consider independent variable and social loafing and which of the choices actually mean social loafing and which doesn't, right? So ultimately, that's, that's how you're going to be approaching MCAT questions. Any questions about questions? OK, cool. So I am going to talk a little bit about um, what kind of, now that you've seen a question, right, you can kind of, uh, we can talk a little bit more about what kinds of questions shows up on the exam. Right. And what is now that you understand that balance between content and critical thinking, right? How does that actually show up on each of the different sections? Because again, it's not uniform, it's it's a little different. In the chemistry and physics section, my you know, my own subjective break, my own subjective um, appraisal of the section is that it's about 70% content knowledge and 30% critical thinking. And critical thinking on the section is in the form of numbers. It's in the form of equations. It's in the form of units. So you're not really, be, you're not in, the, in that section, you're not really so much asked to do like experimental thinking, but more along the lines of like equations and solving problems, right? So I consider that a form of critical thinking because maybe you have the content knowledge of the equation, right? Maybe you, know, you memorize the equation, but can you solve the equation given like these variables? That's critical thinking. That's an application of your content knowledge, right? But there are sometimes experimental critical thinking questions in the way that we just did. But majority, it's more like numbers, more like uh, equations and stuff. And the content knowledge, right? We talked about you know reactions, atomic theory, part of general chemistry, physics concepts, uh, acid and base concepts, titrations and stuff. That's all in here. The number one thing the number one way to study for this section is knowing equations and knowing units. I really struggle with this section because I am not 
um, I think I'm, I'm just not good with numbers. I'm just not good at math. Again, that's like a fixed mindset thing, kind of say. Like, I did become good at math because I studied hard, but I, my own self appraisal of myself is that I'm, I don't really like math. Let's just leave it at that. And equations and units are the number one way that you're going to prove it this because you memorize equations and memorizing it alone isn't enough. You memorize equations and then you, actually use it, right? Memorize and use it in practice problems. And, and units, we're gonna talk more about units, especially when we, when we come to chemistry and physics. And we talked a little bit, we basically talked about this already, it's a, but it's 100% critical thinking. And I mentioned that content knowledge is actually a hindrance. What do I mean by that? If you read a critical analysis passage and you're like, oh wait, this is something I actually know about. Like maybe it's like a hobby that you know about, or maybe it's like you remember something about it from some class that you took. Maybe you took like a philosophy class or something, right? If that happens to you, I want you to immediately dump it from your mind and try to pretend like you've never heard of it before. Because content knowledge is bias and you cannot have bias in this section because you're not supposed to have any exterior content knowledge. What you're supposed to be doing is processing and understanding the passage as if like you say you saw it for the first time and then using your interpretation of the author to answer the questions the key word is interpretation of the author not your opinions if they ask a question you must answer it from the perspective of the author not what you think or what you believe this is very, very important. And it's hard because you wouldn't even, you might not even realize that you're doing it. You might not even realize that you're injecting yourself into the answer, but you have to catch yourself and, and, and be sure that you are purely answering from the perspective of the author and not from yourself or not from outside sources. And so we talked about, uh, you know, understanding the content of the passage itself is, is comprehension. Understanding the author's motivation to infer their opinions about things in the text is reading within the text style questions. And understanding the author's motivations well enough to infer their opinion about new information is reading beyond the text. So those are the three types of questions again. Now, in biology and biochemistry, right, we talk about uh, there's, I would say that this one has 40% content knowledge and 60% critical thinking, because there's a lot of, the content knowledge is very much like the background. You're going to see it when we do some of these practice passages. The content knowledge is, again, it's just presumed. And then they ask you some hard questions about it, right? It's just presumed. They're not asking you about the content. They, you're just supposed to know it already. And now let's ask a, a deep question. Right? And those deep questions often are experimental. You're thinking about an experiment. You're thinking about very in-depth experiments, gene, uh, gene manipulation in, in, in lab mice, or a whole, a whole variety of, of different experiments. And you're going to have to become familiar with how to read a scientific article, how to break down a scientific article, how to actually understand it. This is something that I'm going to help you guys and we're going to um, help you guys with. And we're going to work through uh, science passages like this. Because once you understand what to look for and how they're set up, you can, you can, you can navigate your way through it. But again, the key thing is it's not like reading normally. You're reading with a purpose. You're reading with an intent to find material. Okay. So, oh, another thing that's really important is your content knowledge doesn't mean that you're going to see everything on the, it doesn't mean that you will see everything. How do I explain this? Your content knowledge, um, you will see things on the exam that did not show up in your content review. And it's not because you missed anything. It's because they are presenting to you a brand new situation or something very modern, some very modern 
scientific concept or as current ongoing research. And they're presenting it because you should be able to relate your knowledge to that new unexpected knowledge. And this is sort of like reasoning beyond the text, but with biology, right? So we talked about reasoning beyond the text with, with critical analysis and reasoning. You'll see what I, what I talk about once I, once I show you actual questions. But essentially, don't freak out if you see something that you've never heard of. Understand that it's there because there's something that you know that's related to it that you can, you can actually apply. So you do need strong content of, of biology, biochem, anatomy, and physiology. Psychology and sociology is a weird one because it's actually heavily, heavily, heavily content-based. Heavily content-based. Um, you need to, and we saw it. We saw an example, right? If you don't know what social loafing is, you get this answer wrong. You just get it wrong, right? And so social loafing, so this is kind of the section that's the closest to like, the old SAT where you have to like memorize a bunch of vocabulary, you're gonna be memorizing a bunch of vocabulary for, for psychology and sociology. And so this is a, uh, the thing is like, yes, you're memorizing a lot of vocab, but the good thing is once you, once you actually understand the vocab, the critical thinking part becomes pretty, a lot easier because again, there's two choices that are clearly wrong and then two choices where you're like, hmm, what is the difference between these, right? And that's that's about it. Actually, even a good way to study is to like kind of like uh, randomly pick out like different uh, psych uh, so, so psych and sociology terms, and literally just compare them, right? And just be like, is this similar? Is this different? What does this mean? And that gets you in the mindset of um, how to practice for this exam, uh, for this section of the exam. Um, and then I have another link here that I will share with you guys. But uh, once we, yeah. So, oh, okay. So this is, so So now I guess we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, the questions that you guys had before. So the major question that you guys had before was, you know, how do you actually start studying for this exam? And what time should you be studying for the exam? When, when should, we, you know, those kinds of questions, right? That question, that the answer is not a one size fits all answer, right? Because it heavily, every person has their own unique, um, you know, their own unique content knowledge base already, right? Not everybody has their own unique one. So for example, um, uh, I'm just gonna write here. So for example, right? Actually, who, who said that they were gonna take it like pretty soon? Like next year or next spring or something? Me. Oh, okay. So do you want to do do you mind like do you want to just like go through it? Like can I can we use you as an example, like your knowledge base and stuff? Do you want me to work through that? What do you mean? So, I mean, I would ask you, like, you know, what topics are you strong in? What topics do you think you need more work in? Your own evaluation of where you are. I'm, <laughs> I feel like I know nothing, to be honest. That's fine. So, let's start from there, right? Like, you know, what if you don't know anything? Mm -hmm. Because for me, actually, I can just use myself as an example, because just to give you an idea, right? We have... Uh, so I'm just going to abbreviate. We have biology, biochemistry. We have uh, chem, chem, phys, bio, biochem. And then we have cars. We can't study for, right? But we'll leave it at the bottom for later. And then we have psych, soch. So um, the first, first off, right? You probably know something. Right? You're probably familiar with some things, but you might not know, know everything, right? So first things first, uh, for me, I knew that I was really weak at chemistry and physics. I knew that it was going to be a struggle there. And I knew that for bio and biochem, like it was okay. I knew it was okay, but I knew I would have to review, right? And then for psych soch, I was like, mm, I've only taken those intro classes, so I, I really didn't know, 
right? What, what I was in for. I was like, I, I knew that this was going to be a lot of study. That, that, that was my situation. Now, um, this test is kind of like, there's a lot of things to consider, but one really huge aspect is that, you know, if you consider how we study for undergraduate classes, right? If you have a test, right? You study, you study, you study, you cram for it, right? You take it. And then what happens after you take the test? It's gone, right? That knowledge, whoop, gone, right? Even if you have a cumulative, even if you have like a cumulative final or something, you probably still forget it and you just end up cramming for the final, right? We cannot do that for the MCAT, right? Because you're not being tested at certain points. You have to memorize and understand everything and have a total content base solidified, a content foundation going into the test, right? A very wide, a very wide pool of knowledge, right? Now, what is the good news? The good news is that it's a very shallow pool of knowledge, right? It's why it is wide, right? There are a lot of different topics, but the depth that you need to know these at are like nothing beyond intro level, right? So now the question is like, how do you start? And how do you, how do you start? Um, how do you, how, what, like, where do you actually go, right? The first thing to do is probably to take, take a practice exam. Right. And so you have a little bit of a leg up because I've shown you um, how to approach some of these questions. Right. But I still think taking a practice exam is worthwhile just because you can see like, oh, these are things I clearly don't know. Oh, this I sort of know. Oh, this I, I remember a little bit just because it'll get you acclimated to um, to what the test is actually like. And then and then you are more aware of where what things that you that you actually really don't know and what things that you maybe knew a little bit about and we'll talk a little bit more about like you know what resources you can use for practice exams and stuff actually yeah that's what i was going to show um in the previous slide um so somebody had said like you know what fees are there for the exam and stuff right so this is so if you um, are financially eligible, you can apply for what is called the fee assistance program. And the fee assistance program provides you these resources, all of the official AAMC resources for the exam. These resources are very, very critical. Like ideally you would want to go through all of this at least once, if not you know, several times for some of these you would want to be able to get through all of this, right? So what is, what is, what is included here? The first, uh, the first batch is, as you can see at the top here, it says full length practice products, right? So there are four different exams and there's a sample test. The way that the sample test is different is that it doesn't give you a score, but the other four give you a score. So what is, what it, what's the point of these? how do you use them? Why do you use them, right? You use this towards the end. I'll explain why. Let's talk about the other ones for a moment. The other things are practice products. What are we going to use them for? Obviously to practice, right? So we'll see here that there are things called question packs, right? There's a question pack here. And then there's a question pack here. So these question packs are the bulk of, of the questions that you can, that you get to practice with, right? So there's one for bio, there's one for chem, and there's one for critical analysis. Uh, there isn't one for psychology and sociology, but there is psychology and sociology uh, practice somewhere else. So these guys, so these things are very, very good questions, right? These are MCAT level questions. And these are what you're going to use. Uh, I'll, I'll explain exactly like the typical like study, you know, pat, like study 
journey? Is journey the word I'm looking for? No. Study plan. The study plan um, for, you know, the course of a few months or whatever, right? But the point is, right, the question of, okay, let me finish this and then I'll come to that. So then there's a, 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 for cars, right, these are the two resources that you get for cars questions. And then the rest of these guys are kind of like miscellaneous questions. Oh, sorry, I didn't even notice a physics question pack down there. Right here. And then for the rest of the guys, these are like miscellaneous questions. Um, where did my marker go? Here it is. So these are like kind of miscellaneous assorted questions. And then the last one at the bottom is a section bank. And the section bank is quite an interesting resource. It has all, all, of, the, all of the sections except for cars in it. So this is where you get the majority of your psychology and sociology questions. These questions are hard. These are really hard questions. And these you can basically take at the very end of your, like when you're coming towards the end of your studying and you're seeing like, you know, how much do I actually understand all, all of what I've done so far. So to answer the question of how much you need to study, it's a matter of, you know, your own personal schedule, right? People who have free time versus people who have part-time jobs versus people who have full-time jobs all have different amounts of studying that they can do during a week, right? And longevity, being able to, you can study over a long period of time and it's okay because I'm going to show you ways to, um, to be able to actually keep up with all of the content right over a long period of time right because you might be concerned like if i start studying now what if i forget right we'll talk about we'll talk about that we'll talk about because we're this is like a this is like a marathon this is not a sprint right this is a marathon and you have to prepare for a marathon differently than you prepare for a sprint right and you many of you may never have prepared for a marathon before so we're going to talk about what tools that you need for a marathon that you wouldn't need for a sprint and, and how it's different. Uh, we have a question, what type of MCAT prep books do you recommend and which one did you use? This is a great question. Um, and we're gonna talk about you know, prep and resources and all this in a more organized way at the next session. So, but in, in terms of prep books, right? Prep books are the ones that I use was the Kaplan book set. And I'll tell you what was good and what was bad about the Kaplan book set. The good thing is that it's very easy to read and it's very easy for most subjects. I had a hard time with the physics and I had to find, um, I think I ended up watching like YouTube uh, lectures for physics. But ultimately the best, a prep book, the purpose of a prep book is for you to review or to learn the material, right? And for in that sense, the best prep book for you is the one that you understand the best. That's ultimately the, 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 the way. And so in that case, a prep book might not even be what you want. If you're a visual learner, then you might be better off with the video lectures. For example, we'll talk about another very important resource, Khan Academy has created a course with the AAMC. So it was created with them and it has all of the content on the exam. So we are going to talk uh, in depth about, you know, all the different resources that are available for practicing, some free, some paid, but there are a ton of resources out there and understanding what the best resources are for you is what I, is what I want to help you do. So for example, if you're more into video learning, right? And if books bore you to tears, then maybe Khan Academy is an example. There's other YouTube uh, channels that are an example. Um, if you are, uh, I think there's even like podcasts out there. I'm pretty sure there's like MCAT prep podcasts out there if you're like an audio learner or something. And so basically, remember that the point of a prep book is very limited, right? Yes, you can read a prep book and you can study a prep book, but it doesn't give you practice with critical thinking.
right? So the point of the prep book is just to read and understand um, the material. And we'll go, we'll go into more, we'll go into more how you can figure out, you know, what prep set to use, what's right for you. Um, so overall, uh, so yes, so overall, so we come to the end of our first session and next week we are going to talk about, you know, creating specifically study schedules since that was something that a lot of people are, are uh, wondering about and how to actually study effectively. Right. This is this is something important. And you really wouldn't know how to study effectively until you learn about it or until you find out about it. Because I'm sure everybody here is studying, right? But have you ever looked into what works and what doesn't work? Have you ever thought about like, is there a better way that I could be studying? Right. So we do want to maximize our time because there is so much stuff to learn. Right. So I am going to teach you some, you know, things about the science of study, because it is a science and there are things that objectively we can do better and objectively we can do worse. And obviously you want to avoid the worst things. And like we mentioned, we're going to talk about um, the resources that that I recommend or, or whatever. So now. Um, so, yeah, that is the first session. Um, I'm going and thanks everybody.